Great. Thank, thanks very much. Um, I, I've come from across the world, as you know, and I just want to point out that um, this is where I work in Sydney. But I was actually born up here in, in a pretty rough part of Australia. Some people might consider it the Wild West. And um, this part here. And I wanted to point out that there are actually quite close connections between Australia and Norway. And even though we're on the opposite side of the world, there was a big Norwegian whaling station down in southwest of Western Australia. Can we let to talk about whaling? <laughs> so, and there's a big hydroelectric scheme here that depended a lot on Norwegian engineers. But there's a lot of Norwegian immigration into this wild west part of Australia. And one of those uh, Norwegians that came and was a surveyor and mapped this northern part of Queensland um, was actually born about 25 kilometres from here. And he's my grandfather. And uh, so that's a very recent photo. So I've, as much as I'm excited to be here for the CSF, it's also a feeling of being back to my roots. So what I want to talk about, though, is, is our interest in syringa myelia, which is this condition where cystic cavities form inside the spinal cord, either inside the central canal or outside the central canal. But it is clearly a dynamic problem with very high pressure uh, cysts forming inside the cord that make the cord expand and damage the cord. And for that to happen, there has to be a, a, an imbalance at some point at least between the inflow and outflow of fluid into the spinal cord. Um, we know that... Um, Hal, I hope I still have your courtesy to, do, <laughs> to use this, this video. But we know that fluid flows into the central nervous system, in particular uh, in this context, into the spinal cord, um, particularly related, related to arterial pulsations. And we know that that fluid in the spinal cord runs into the central canal, at least in the animal models that we study. We know now, though, that respiration has significant impacts on the CSF flow, at least in the subarachnoid space. But what we don't know is much about the impact of changes in heart rate, blood pressure, and in particular the influence of respiration on fluid flow into and out of the spinal cord. So our questions here are around those issues of what affects the fluid flow in the subarachnoid space, but also in terms of fluid flow into the spinal cord and out of the spinal cord. And so what we're studying here in this, uh, this work is the normal physiology in the spinal cord, which we will, will obviously have implications to how syringa myelia forms. So we did this in a uh, rat uh, model, and we're investigating flow in the subarachnoid space, flow into the spinal cord, and flow out of the spinal cord. And we're doing that by injecting CSF tracers into the cisterna magna for these studies. And then for looking at fluid flow out of the spinal cord, we're looking at injections of tracer actually into the spinal cord parenchyma. And we do that with uh, the animals uh, anaesthetized and with very careful control of the physiological variables. So we're controlling heart rate, uh, respiratory pressure, um, either by having the animals mechanically ventilated so that there's constantly positive thoracic pressure or having the, the animals anaesthetised but free breathing, meaning that there are uh, periods of negative thoracic pressure during the respiratory cycle. And we know that we can control these physiological variables very tightly. So uh, we can then, in that setting, uh, with the free breathing animals with negative intrathoracic pressure during periods, we can then change the blood pressure and we can change the heart rate. So we can look at these different uh, physiological circumstances. I've put this up to show that uh, I've, we've got some in vivo studies where we're looking at the CSF tracer flow in a live animal, animal that's anaesthetized. And in these experiments, what we do is we do an a exposure of the cervical spine. Now, to the non-surgeons, I'm sure that just looks like a red mess, but um, this is... There's a needle here going into the cisterna magna, and this is the cervical spine that has been exposed. And we don't remove the bone. We can, we can get fluorescence signal through the bone in rats, except at the C2 level, because the C2 bone is quite thick. But we decided to not remove the bone because we think that, will, that would potentially uh, alter the CSF dynamics. So in, this, in these experiments, we've got this exposed. We have a needle through into the cisterna magna, and we can expose, we can do fluorescence signal tracing. 
So in these studies, we've got animals with periodic negative intrathoracic pressure, and the animal on the right has constant positive thoracic pressure, so they're mechanically ventilated. So even during uh, inspiration and expression, there's positive pressure. And the point here is fluorescent tracer is injected into the cisterna magna, and these videos are sped up. So what we're watching here is what happens over a period of a few minutes, and we're watching the CSF tracer spread down the cervical spinal cord. So it's dark here where C2 is because that's thick bone. But what I think can be appreciated is that CSF reaches the lower parts of the cervical spine much more quickly and in greater quantities in the animals that have uh, free breathing, so in other words, periods of negative thoracic pressure than in the animals that have constant positive pressure. And we can quantify that by quantifying the fluorescence signal and looking at it over different, over different time periods. And there is a significant difference in the group of animals that have free breathing, breathing compared to the positive uh, mechanical pressure ventilation animal. So the, the point about that is that uh, free breathing or negative intrathoracic pressure periods, but it didn't matter whether they altered the, the blood pressure or the heart rate, caused changes or an increase in the fluid flow in the subarachnoid space through the cervical spine. So now we're looking at the fluid flow into the spinal cord. Uh, so this is again, the tracer is injected in the cisterna magna. We know it goes down the subarachnoid space. And then we're looking at it uh, both macroscopically with a, uh, uh, a fluorescence uh, cabinet, camera, but also uh, microscopically to look at how, far, how much tracer gets into the spinal cord at each level. And with those studies, we, we showed that not only does the positive pressure ventilation reduce fluid flow in the subarachnoid space, it actually reduces fluid flow into the spinal cord. So the, there is a greater amount of tracer totally within the spinal cord, but also around the blood vessels uh, in the animals that have periods of uh, intermittent negative pressure. And that applies to the whole spinal cord, white matter and gray matter. And then in the hypertensive experiments, I know it's, the room's very light, so it's hard to see these images, but for the hypertensive animals, there was uh, no increase of fluid flow into the spinal cord. And also with the tachycardic animals, compared to the, uh, the, norm, the, the animals with the normal heart rate, there was an increase in fluid flow into the grey matter, but not the total spinal cord or the white matter. We'd like to look at fluid flow into the spinal cord in vivo, right? So looking at not just the post-mortem histological changes, but looking at flow around the blood vessels in live animals. And to do that, uh, the only way that really could be, that could be done at the moment is using the two-photon microscopy. But this is very difficult in these animals because as opposed to the studies that you've probably seen in the, in the brain, where the brain, the head is fixed in the stereotaxic frame, we can't do that with the spine and with respiration the spine is moving up and down but uh, nevertheless we've done these experiments and injected uh, microspheres into the subarachnoid space and uh, done studies here so this is free breathing animals what we're looking at is the blue dots these are the csf traces the vessels come in and out because the the spine's moving up and down with respiration what we can do is trace those blue dots and so here's the negative thoracic pressure animals the positive pressure animals and what we showed that uh, in the animals with free breathing the velocity and uh, distance of flow of those uh, microspheres has increased in hypertension and this has recently been shown in the brain as well that in hypertensive animals that flow around blood vessels is actually reduced and we showed the same thing in the spinal cord. So with an increase in blood pressure, the flow and the velocity of those particles being tracked here along the blood vessels was less than in the animals with normal blood pressure. Uh, heart rate did not make a difference. Now, obviously it's a bit hard to tell, I reckon, in, our, in rats because the, normal, the resting heart rate's about 300. So um, we are changing it a lot, but it may be different in humans. But with tachycardia, we did not see any increase in the perivascular flow. So uh, just summarising that, it was the free breathing or the negative intrathoracic pressure animals that had an increase in fluid flow around blood vessels uh, in vivo. So turning now to the 
the spinal fluid outflow and we wanted, we're interested in what happens when uh, with fluid not just in the spinal cord as a whole but, spi but fluid from the grey matter and from the white matter. So we were able to inject stereotactically into specifically the grey matter or specifically the white matter. So uh, these again, I'm, and I'm sorry with a, with a room that's very light, it's hard to see, but this is an injection uh, in white matter, so adjacent to the grey matter, and then we can look at, at each level, uh, quantify the fluorescent tracer, and with different groups of animals, look at different time points. And we're able to see the distribution of tracer at each of the levels, so C8, T1, T3, uh, with the different uh, physiological circumstances. And what we showed is that in terms of outflow, although res respiration had significant impacts on fluid flow in the subarachnoid space and into the cord, it did not actually have any impact on fluid flow out of the cord, either in white matter, grey matter, or the uh, or the whole, uh, sorry, the, the um, whole spinal cord, grey matter, or white matter. But hypertension, which reduced fluid flow into the cord, uh, increased the fluid flow out of the cord. So in animals that had the blood pressure increased, there was a greater movement of CSF tracer uh, out of the cord. And similarly with tachycardia, so in these animals that have a very high resting heart rate, but if we increase the heart rate uh, by pacing them, we showed that in whole spinal cord, so both grey matter and white matter injections, uh, heart rate increased the amount of uh, fluid flow out of the spinal cord. We've heard some people, we've talked already this morning about the precise pathways of fluid flow and if there is this concept of the lymphatic uh, system where flow is specifically from arteries to veins, then on our inflow studies we ought to see flow only around arteries and our outflow studies we should see flow only around veins. Right. So what we showed though is that in both the inflow studies and the outflow studies there was tracer around all different types of vessels and we were able to identify those by, uh, again it's difficult to see, but we, we're staining here for smooth muscle lactin so we're able to identify arteries and arterioles and in, in these images the CSF tracer is fluorescent albumin which is in, in green, this is the combined image here and we're able to show that there is uh, fluorescent tracer around arterioles both in the inflow studies and the outflow studies. And this is a three-dimensional uh, image taken of the anterior spinal artery. This is in the outflow, this one you might be able to see. So we've got endothelium stained, smooth muscle stained and then the CSF tracer is just outside the smooth muscle and that occurs in the outflow. So we've injected into the spinal cord and then the tracer is specifically around the anterior spinal artery smooth muscle. So this is evidence, I think, you know, against that pure glymphatic uh, pathway. And similarly in venules, so venules stain negative for smooth muscle, so there's, there's no smooth muscle here. There is tracer both on inflow and outflow around, uh, around these vessels. So the central canal is of particular importance, uh, significance to us, or interest to us, so both in outflow, so these are animals where the injection uh, is into the spinal cord, there is CSF tracer that goes specifically between ependymal cells to reach the central canal lumen, and in inflow, as we've, de and we and others have demonstrated on many occasions, there is flow that reaches the central canal specifically from uh, perivascular pathways in between ependymal cells to reach the, to reach the central canal lumen. So to summarise all that, uh, the intrathoracic pressure uh, or respiration does have a significant effect not just on spinal subarachnoid space flow but also on spinal uh, parenchymal fluid inflow but not outflow. Whereas the cardiovascular uh, physiology plays a smaller role in the subarachnoid space dynamics but a much more significant role on interstitial fluid flow, particularly on outflow. So where we're going to next is to uh, hopefully develop our techniques better so we can look at the in vivo outflow. That's going to be technically very challenging, um, but that would be particularly interesting. And then once we've, got a, a, we've completed that study, we'll want to look at 
the, the fluid flow in pathological situations, particularly those that relate to syringomyelia, so particularly where there is spinal cord injury, obstructions in the subarachnoid space, and see how that perturbs the fluid flow into and out of the spinal cord. Um, there's obviously a large group that does this work, and I wanted to, I should have pointed out at the beginning, this is actually work done by Shinu Liu over the last couple of years as uh, part of his PhD. Uh, he's, about, he's about a year away from com completing his neurosurgery training, so hopefully he'll be at these meetings in the future as a clinical neurosurgeon with an ongoing interest in CSF physiology. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Beautiful talk. So when you do the free breathing, you of course yeah. will change the pressure and what we were talked about yesterday when you're a neurosurgeon, you're interested in the mechanical stuff and not the molecular. So if we do not ventilate our rats, we yeah. see a severe drop in CSF secretion and a change to blood pH and a lot of molecular effects on top of your pressure change, uh, which you may not be aware of if you don't check these things. Uh, is there any way that you can actually change the pressure without, while you still have them ventilated? Can you mingle that somehow so that you can sort of exclude that it's secondary? It's not the pressure itself, but it's the molecular parts. I, I mean, that's, that's a good, I'm not sure I can answer all that question, but what I didn't go into in detail is that, so even for the free breathing animals, they, we are measuring the respiratory pressure. So their trachea is cannulated, we've got pressure measurements on that. And for the animals that are have positive pressure ventilation, and for, for both sets of animals, we're measuring pH and blood gases as well, and making sure that they're maintained at a physiological range. Um, so even the, the free breathing animals are not becoming acidotic, for example. Okay, all right, yeah. very good, thank you. Thank you for the talk, it was nice uh, to listen to. My, uh, my question is regarding fluid production in the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. So you say that the respiration increases inflow but reduces outflow from the cord, is that correct? So respiration or? did not influence, uh, sorry, res respiration had mostly an effect on the subarachnoid space flow but not inflow. Okay. That's not talking about production though, that's just talking about the, the movement. Okay, but, but hypertension that decreased inflow? Yep, uh, as it does in the brain. Increased outflow, right? Correct. So that's, does that suggest that you have increased production of fluid in the spinal cord, or did you try to make this link? Or? Um, we can, I don't think, answer the mechanism. We've injected tracer into the spinal cord, and in animals that are hypertensive, there is a more rapid movement away. Now, whether that's because more there's more fluid coming across the blood spinal cord barrier in those animals, that's, that's pushing that out or whether that's related to the, um, a greater movement of the blood vessel wall in, in the, in the, and affecting the vertebroband spaces. Um, I can't answer that. Uh, it'll be something like that that's affecting it. Is that what you're getting at in terms of CSF production is fluid coming across the blood spinal cord barrier? Yeah. So I see your um, result that you have respiration changing how the tracer goes down the spine in the yep. subarachnoid space. And I'm wondering, how do you know that the, um, the downstream effect into the cord, that also increased with respiration? Is that right? It, in, into the spinal cord? Into no. the cord. Oh, it no. didn't. Okay. Did not influence fluid it, flow in. Okay. So just... Yep within the subarachnoid space, it was yep. increased, but not into the cord. Mm -hmm. ah, okay. Answers my question. Um, I, I, as I understand it, what you measured was uh, tracer transport, yep. but you kept saying fluid flow. <laughs> so okay. can, can, we, can, we, can we make a distinction oh. between okay. those two? So we've always tried to use uh, molecular weight uh, traces that, are, that ought to be indicative of bulk flow rather than diffusion. So these traces were all albumin, so it's about 40,000, so 40 kilodaltons thereabout, thereabouts, which ought to be uh, indicative of, of bulk flow. Um, 
that's the best I can answer your question. I mean, obviously, these are very difficult studies, right? Uh, in terms of uh, of understanding exactly where the water goes, it was the same as in in your talk in terms of the it was gadolinium presum presumably that you're using. The molecular weight's really important in terms of whether it's diffusion, bulk flow, or a, a combination of those. Yeah, and, and there's a shear augmented dispersion which can transport tracers much faster than diffusion itself, and mm -hmm. so I think we need to be very careful about uh, um, distinguishing what we're reporting as uh, movement of tracers. Yeah. Uh, and if we, if we want to say fluid flow, then we really need to measure the fluid flow. Uh, so I'm taking a bit of license that. from saying <laughs> fluid flow in the papers. We'll make sure we talk about tracer. Okay. Yep. I, take, I take your point. And unless you've got a, 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 you know, a suggestion of how better to study, um, I think what you're saying is to use better, making sure the language is more careful unless you've got a, a suggestion as to how better to study fluid flow. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, to, to actually measure fluid flow, you, uh, you, you need to measure the, the movement of the water or whatever right. the fluid is. Right. Uh, the, the, the tracer can move by a number of mechanisms, and yeah. uh, you know, in these complex environments, uh, we don't know unless yeah. we measure both or do some modeling to try to figure out what it is. I so completely understand, yep. Mine's a comment on this discussion. The uh, using larger tracers causes the Stokes number to be lower uh, and causes the Peckley number to be higher. So that what you're going for is that advection dominates diffusion. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then it also shuts down shear enhanced dispersion because that's that's a superposition of <laughs> Disper uh, uh, diffusion in one direction and advection in another. So with no diffusion, that's just it. I think we can continue this discussion in the coffee break. There's uh, coffee, uh, I suggest we go out to the kind of main room, have some coffee there, um, and we'll be back here in 15 minutes.